again. How do they know what parts of the brain do what things? And one of them, obviously, is PET scanning, as we've uh, already discussed. Uh, another one is EEG. They, you know what EEG is, and they uh, have you do certain activities and look at the increase in uh, neural activity in certain parts of the scalp, that's an indirect thing. Animal studies uh, where they can inject a tracer into something, like if they inject a tracer into here, they can look at the dorsal root ganglia and see which levels supply that part of the skin. So um, that's track tracing. Uh, obviously diseases uh, at the gross level, the Parkinson's disease, and then lesions themselves. We talked about that early on. If you lesion part of the cord, but what happens when you stain for it? Or another thing has to do uh, with like this guy Phineas Gage. Back in the 1800s, he was working in the railroads, and they were uh, building a railroad through some mountainous area. They were drilling holes in the rock, and they put dynamite in the rock, and then they take this rod and tamp the dynamite down into the, the hole. Well, he was tamping the thing into the hole, and it exploded and shot the tamper, tampering rod through his head, and right there, and wiped out his uh, frontal cortex. So Gage went from being a decent fellow uh, to one that had all these types of behavioral problems that were well characterized. <laughs> he lived. I mean, nobody lived with this type of injury in the 1800s. But he did. Um, and so they chronicled his life after the accident. It, you know, it's a, kind of a cool bedtime Google thing you got going on there. So, okay? Phineas Gage is the guy's name. Um, generally speaking, uh, motor function is in the uh, frontal lobe, not the prefrontal area so much as the frontal lobe. We know about the premotor cortex and then area four. Sensory um, sensation and uh, memories are a lot in the parietal lobe, okay. um, uh, which is more posterior. I mentioned earlier that the primary areas and association areas are usually right next to each other. And they're connected by what are called associational fibers. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, if you look at uh, through phylogeny, about what areas of cortex are dedicated to certain functions. If you look at just motor and sensory, relatively speaking, ours is minor versus lower uh, phylogenetic uh, species that have no higher cortical function. I mean, that's obvious. A rat's not going to sit there and calculate typically. But we had a rat. We had a, um, a pet rat. Have you guys, did I ever tell you about the story about the pet rat? We had this pet rat, it was called Annabelle. <laughs> she was a hooded rat. And she was about, we bought her at the pet store. I don't know why my wife decided to buy rats. But anyway, you know, with the PMDD, you know, whenever, whenever I see Michael's bags on the counter at home, I know where she is on that wheel that I showed you Tuesday, okay? The thing about the four sewing machines and the, you know, we had so many curtain rods, I eventually threw them all, I gave them all the way to Salvation Army except for one set. That is like the, the, Memorial curtain rod. Anytime she started <laughs> acting weird, I just bring out the damn curtain rod. There you go. <laughs> anyway, we had these pretty rats. And I would sit there, these rats, if you ever need a pet, get a rat. Uh, we would let the thing out of the cage, and uh, she would run around the house and she'd crawl up my leg, and I'm sitting there chewing gum. She would come, and I'm watching TV, and she would come right here. She would watch me. And then she'd take her front paws and pull down on <laughs> to see what I was chewing. The weirdest thing. And she loved me so much. <laughs> you know, the dog bowl, you know, the dog food. 
food every night. She would go and get a, a dog food pellet, take it up the stairs, climb up on the bed. Every night when I got to bed, there would be a little pile of dog food on my pillow. <laughs> Matthew, you're not appreciating that story. That's a true story. Are you heartless or what? I guess so. <laughs> anyway. Okay. Oh. <laughs> so, <laughs> the area of a cortex dedicated to uh, higher emotional behavior uh, here in our prefrontal areas uh, versus a dog versus a cat. Notice the great distinction between dogs and cats here. There's another reason cats should be killed. They really have no emotional response to anything, so why do they need to exist? Okay. So anyway, if we look at uh, some growth structure of the cerebral cortex, you have uh, the different gyri and the sulci. Um, there are poles associated with the um, cortex. The frontal pole is in the anterior cranial fossa. The middle pole is the temporal lobes. That's in the middle cranial fossa. And the posterior pole of the cortex, remember, it sits on the tentorium <coughs> cerebelli. It is not in the posterior cranial fossa. That's the domain of the cerebellum and the brainstem. If you look at the fissures, there are two primary, th well, three primary fissures. There are two lateral fissures of sylvian. Sylvian fissures is what they're called, sylvian. And then there's the sagittal fissure, also known as the long, longitudinal fissure. It's not on the it's not on the image. I just made the name up, sylvian. I didn't make it up, it's real. Okay. Uh, if you look at the lobes of the cortex, there are five lobes. Um, and those lobes are um, demarcated by the sulci. So the frontal lobe is divided and separated from the parietal lobe by the central sulcus. The frontal and parietal lobes are separated from the temporal lobe by the lateral fissure. The occipital lobe is best, that division is best seen between it and the parietal lobe. If you look on the medial side, there's the parietal occipital sulcus there. Now you see the nice partition occipital lobe. That would be the calcarine sulcus right there. That's the primary uh, motor strip 17 and 17, 18 and 19 are here. So, see that? Uh, I will tell you that this is a um, rather simplified picture here because each one of these gyri has a name. So thankfully we're not going to go into that here in this course. So, the cingulate gyrus, uh, as I mentioned earlier, is here it sits right above the corpus callosum, which again is the big uh, commissural fiber tract between the right and left hemispheres. The limbic course, uh, cortex is designed in here. This is the corpus, I mean the cingulate gyrus, and then it goes on around. If you remove the cerebellum and the brainstem, it kind of keep, continues on around as what's called the perihippocampal gyrus, ending in the uncus. You remember the uncus as uncle herniations in increased intracranial pressure. The uncle herniations will herniate through what? Not the parietal magnum, that's a tonsillar herniation. Right, through the tentorium cerebelli uh, right there. The fox herniation is, is different. All right. The insula is the fifth lobe. And what you do there is you, you uh, look down in through the lateral fissure, and then you see the insula here. Uh, the frontal lobe is generally motor. The, uh, the parietal lobe is generally sensor, sensory. We know the uh, occipital lobe is vision. Temporal is uh, special senses like hearing and uh, emotion and the uh, insula here is uh, primarily responsible. Uh, well, here we go. Uh, right, I forgot I added this last night. Uh, there's the explanation for what the insula does. Has a lot to do with um, 
behavioral type uh, functions. Behavioral type functions. So cognitive functioning, if you go back to the uh, dementia lecture, and we talked about Alzheimer's disease, where you see a lot of degeneration of cortex is going to be in the insula. Cortical white matter is here, uh, separated, I mean, the gray matter is on the outside of it. So this is all leading down to, what is that structure right there? Internal capsules. That's the internal capsule, right? So this is going to be the what? The putamen, the globus pallidus? Okay, good. The fibers of the, uh, of the cortex, there are different types. The association fibers, there are two types. There are short association fibers. Those go from one side to the next. Those are the blue ones up here. Those go from one gyrus to the adjacent gyrus. Just connect them. Like from the motor, I mean, the area 312 into the parietal uh, lobe. Then there are the long associational fibers that are going to be traversing lobes. So you've got the frontal lobe talking with the parietal lobe talking with the temporal lobe and so on. Those are the association fibers. Then you have colossal fibers connecting one side to the next. One cerebral hemisphere to the next. And finally you have the fugal fibers or the projection fibers that are leaving the, uh, the cortex to go into the brain stem which will be cortical bulbar or spinal cortical spinal. Here are the short association fibers. You can see them going from, if you dissect it down through the gray matter, you can see these band of fibers like that versus the long associated fibers that you see right here. The corpus callosum, there are three primary connections between the right and left hemispheres. The corpus callosum is by far the largest. And then there's a small, um, anterior, and there's a posterior one that's too small to see here, there's an anterior um, connection and a posterior connection, but 99% of the connection between the right and left hemispheres is the corpus callosum. It has different parts. It starts out like this, you know, it looks like that. So this part is the genu, which is the bend, the genu, like your knee, genuflex, the body, and in the splenium of the, of the corpus callosum is out here. If you look at this section here, so we've gone through here, what you're going to do is you're going to catch the corpus callosum, the genu here, and the splenium is here. Get that orientation? Okay, so here's the cool thing. Epilepsy that starts in one area of the cortex, let's say, uh, starts out here. So what is epilepsy? It's just abnormal discharge of uh, neural firing, right? If that um, proceeds to occupy the entire hemisphere, that's when people start having grand mal seizures. If they have grand mal seizures on the other side, that means, or both sides, that means that that ectopic foci crossed to the other side through the corpus callosum and, and through the anterior and posterior commissure. <coughs> so what you can do, the problem with, obviously what Dr. Morgan was saying is that the problem with grand mal seizures, you can die. Well, what we can do is if you have intractable seizures, intractable grand mal seizures that aren't responsive to all those medications he talked about, what we can do is confine the seizure activity to one hemisphere. And that way you're much less likely to die from asphyxiation or something else. And the way to do that is go in here with a knife, with a scalpel, and cut the anterior commissure and the corpus callosum. That will confine the seizure activity to one hemisphere. 
But now, you don't have one brain, you have two that can't talk to each other, and they operate opposite sides of the body. Now, if you had one of these surgeries, you could be in this program. You wouldn't know that you had this problem. Right? But you could find it out. So he mentioned yesterday, and I'll talk about it here more in a minute, the speech center, Russell Wheeler mentioned that the speech center, right-handed people, is on the left side. Right? Correct? So if I put a screen up in front of Andrew, and he's had this surgery, and I'm behind the screen, he can't see what I'm doing, and I put a one of Sophie's bananas right here, and had him, you're right-handed, right? Had him reach through there and pick up that banana. Which side the speech center on? Left. Yeah. If I have him pick up the banana with his right hand, and I say, Andrew, what is that? He can say left. Because that sensory information went up to the left side of his brain, where his speech center is. But if he reaches through there and he grabs that banana with his left hand, I say, Andrew, what is that? He would say, don't know. I can't tell you. Because his right brain knows what it is, but it can't tell the left side to say banana. But then if I said, Andrew, take this pen and write on a piece of paper with your left hand what it is, he can write banana. His right brain knows what it is, he just can't say it. He doesn't have no speech center. But if I put the pen in his right hand and say, Andrew, write what it is, he wouldn't be able to write it because the left brain doesn't know what it is. He could write it with his left side, look at it, and then say left, but they don't talk to each other. If you go uh, and do YouTube with split brain experiments, they used to do these up until about the 70s. Uh, now the medications don't work so well, they don't do them anymore. But if you do YouTube split brain um, experiments, they go through all of these things. It is the most jacked up looking thing you're ever going to see. And it's just a matter of, but you encounter them on the street, you wouldn't know. All right. There's also lesions in the cortex. This is kind of interesting. It gives you primary, lesions in these primary areas are going to cause these types of dysfunctions. You should have an appreciation of this, certainly. Um, cortical asymmetry. If you compare this slide with this one, you'll see that they're not the same. You always know about the left brain is more um, mathematically engineering uh, versus the right side is more artsy um, literature. Uh, that's actually true. That's not uh, a myth. That is true. Oh, by the way, I saw last night that that guy about the... Um, the guy that debunks the myths, he's going to do one on hospitals next week. So that should be a good one about you know, hospital building. And, uh, so, anyway. Uh, if you look at um, uh, this, uh, lesions, one of them that we've talked about before is hemiglobin. If you lesion the right parietal lobe, this is where you find hemiglobin as the most Profound has the most profound effect. You just ignore the left side of the body. And you can see this person right here, they drew an entire clock face on one side, on the right side. This is a person who would not shave the left that I mentioned earlier. When you try to get them to do spatial things, you see they're all just jacked up here. They're not, and so that's why when you do your mini mental status exam, you have two pentagons intersecting. <coughs> You're looking for this type of lesion here, being able to process that spatial orientation. All right, the laterality of language. We, uh, so we talked about speech center being on the left. If you look at 100 people, you know, right-handed, 96% of them, 
or 96 of them, are going to have the speech center on the left. A small percentage is going to be on the right. If you're left-handed, though, only 70, well, not, if you're left-handed, 70% of left-handed people are still going to have the speech center on the left. A smaller percentage on the right. Now, why is this important? This is important because if you have, uh, you know, Senator McCain was just diagnosed with glioblastoma, right? We know that's not good. Um, if, it, if it's here, and you're going to go in, if a neurosurgeon is going to take it out, if I go in there, and you know, one of the complications you're going to have following this surgery is a, is a complete inability to speak. I'm going to damage Broca's area. That's not a good, I mean, that's, you know, okay, well, let's, let's talk about this for a minute. But if your speech center is on the other side, take it out. You don't need it. Broca's area, we mentioned, is on the left side. But in that percentage of left-handed people is on the other side. So how do you know which side is on? It's really simple. Before surgery, what they're going to do is they're going to have you sit there. They're going to run a catheter up into your internal carotid artery. And they're going to say, okay, let's say it's going to be up into the left <coughs> internal carotid artery because the odds are most of it's going to be on that side, right? Correct? So, okay, start counting down from 100. And then they're going to inject a little pentobarbital into that internal carotid artery and anesthetize this side of your brain. And if you stop talking, the speech center is on that side. If you keep talking, it's over here. That's how they know. Prosody is, um, so we talked about the mechanism of speech being the Broca's area. But most of speech, a large part of speech, or a large part of language, is prosody. And that is how it's, how it's said. Inflection, tone, temper, all that kind of stuff. That's what that means right there. Okay? Uh, I, I, I'm not exactly sure why I put this in this order, but uh, here it is. Uh, we saw from uh, Dr. Morgan yesterday, this is obviously a seizure. This is obviously a seizure activity. Um, this is what yours looks like now. It does not change a lot when you sleep. Well, how is it that you're asleep? That's because there are parts of your nervous system that disconnect your thinking brain with wakefulness. It's namely in your pawns. In addition to the locus ceruleus that helps you wake up, there's another structure in the pond called the reticular activating system that allows you to sleep, but your brain is still going. You're dreaming, you're thinking about uh, all sorts of things. This one, though, is not good. This is uh, no activity whatsoever in the, in the brain. And what is going on here is there's a thing called a, um, it's a, uh, I don't know the exact name of it. I can't remember the exact name of it. Kim, you might help me here. Um, if you, if this is you and you're, or your patient, and uh, they're still, they're on a ventilator and you're keeping them alive mechanically. <coughs> there's a test where you uh, disconnect the, the ventilator and you give them 20 seconds to breathe on their own. Uh, if they don't, then you're not going to come back. You remember your respiratory and your cardiac centers are in your brain stem. So regardless of what's going on here, you can survive with your heart beating and your breathing for a long, 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 long time. But that respiratory challenge, what, do you remember what it's called? Um, no, because we never had to do it. I mean, we never had a patient in like, Yeah, it's, um, it. we only okay. weaned them off of meds that never Well, they try it twice, and if you don't breathe spontaneously by the second time in 20 seconds, then you, uh, you're, you, have, you, you cannot sustain life by yourself. So. Karen Quinlan was the case years ago where she was 
brain dead, yet live for a long, long, long time in a, in a vegetative state uh, because she still had a, um, uh, I think she had a, she was on a ventilator and then they took her, there was a huge court case about whether or not to take her off the ventilator. When they finally took her, they won the court case, took her off the ventilator, she kept breathing on her own. So it was a bad. Karen Quinlan, I think was her name. Okay, language. All right, the two things about language here we need to talk about are a Broca's area and Wernicke's area. We know that Broca's area is the motor speech area. It drives the vocal pole. Well, what is Wernicke's area? What did I do? <laughs> Wernicke's area is what's called the receptive area. So when I say, Shelby, what is that thing right there? You say what? Gum. Gum. She said gum. When I said, Shelby, what is that thing right there? She had to hear that. And then that auditory information made it to the transverse gyrus of Heschel. That auditory information there said, okay, up into her parietal lobe. Uh, from my memories of language, what did that mean? And then that went down to Wernicke's area that says, you know what I need to do? Is I need to formulate with my mouth and my vocal folds the word gum. And so once I know that, that is the word I need to say, that information goes to Broca's area, and she says, come. So if she has a lesion in Broca's area, if she works, if she has an embolus or a thrombus in the, are you right-handed or left-handed? Right. She's right-handed if she has a thrombus in the left middle cerebral artery. You know that supplies that area. If it's big enough, it's going to get Broca's area. So if I say, Shelby, what is that right there? She cannot drive her vocal folds to say gum. She is speechless. That is called expressive aphasia. She cannot talk. You always hear people with stroke that can't talk. That's why they got Broca's area. If, though, the stroke involved Wernicke's area, she can talk. But the problem is, she can't associate the proper word with which to speak. It's a receptive problem called receptive aphasia. Now, I'll give you an example. Remember uh, yesterday, uh, Dr. Morgan started his lecture by talking about Bob Brooks. Remember he said Bob Brooks knew more about neurology than any neurologist in the state? I think he said something like that. He was a PA. He was the first one in the first class that graduated from OU in 1972. Been his entire life in neurology. Smart guy. About um, in the late 90s, uh, he was at home uh, with his wife, and he, he stroked. And he stroked, what was, in, what was involved was he nailed Wernicke's area. So IMSA goes there to get him, and he, as a, neuro, as a neurology PA, knows exactly what's going on. So when the uh, ambulance gets there, he's trying to tell the paramedics what's going on, but it's just coming out just bizarre language. When a friend of mine and I went to visit him in the hospital, everybody called him Brooksy. Brooksy, what, um, you know, how are you feeling? And he would look at you and just, you could see in his eyes, he's trying to find the right word. But I remember exactly what he said. I said, how are you doing, Brooksy? He said, my sister arrives this afternoon. My sister's flight arrives this afternoon at 3 o'clock. That's exactly what he said to me. And he, he heard that. 
And he knew it was not the right thing to say. He just could not say fine. That's the difference between broke as aphasia and weren't as aphasia. Or expressive versus receptive. Could he write down a sentence? That oh, he could write it down. Yeah, he could write it down. Cool. And I think I think Morgan said that yesterday. That they can, you know, that they now if the stroke is massive enough, they lose. You know, when you start getting up into here with the stroke, then you start losing the memories that led to language. You get some bizarre stuff. But his was a very localized stroke, just to Wernicke's area. So cognitively, he was all there. He just couldn't attach the right word to the question. What now, was he talking about yesterday when they can't, they don't interpret that they're saying the wrong thing? So they that's what, that's what I'm saying. If the lesion is okay. massive okay. enough, okay. They, don't, they don't get it that it's not connected. Okay. His was very focused. But he knew, and when he said something, he could hear it and say, that's not what I wanted to say. Okay. He recovered from that stroke. He wound up having another stroke about a year later and killed him. But that was, uh, that was an interesting thing. You know, when he recovered from it, he was, and a lot of the, uh, one thing I forgot to mention uh, at some point, is that neural deficit due to stroke, injury, whatever, uh, if it's not transected. Um, well, you know, when he, they were talking yesterday about the penumbra, penumbra, you know, uh, Russell Wheeler said, okay, here's the, the core of the stroke. This is dead tissue. It ain't coming back. It's dead. It's necrotic. What your goal is in stroke therapy and TPA is to preserve as much of the penumbra as you can. That's why you use TPA. It has nothing to do with the core. So if you wind up with uh, a whole host of neurological deficit, recovery of the penumbra is possible. And you always tell people with a um, stroke or injury, it's not transection, that you can usually uh, repair some of this nerve tissue but after a year, whatever function you get back after a year is where you're going to stay. After a year, you're not going to recover more function. But if you have a spinal cord injury and the spinal cord is contused, you may be paraplegic. You know, you hear about the people, they, you know, now they're, they're walking. Well, you're, you're walking because it took a year for the <coughs> nervous system to recover from the spinal shock. If you transect the spinal cord, you will never walk again, period. Not tomorrow, not a year from now, not a hundred years from now. Okay. But anyway, with Brooksy, you know, uh, several months after his first stroke, it was, we were all sitting around. He was kind of, he said, you know, I, the paramedic got there, and I was trying to tell him exactly what was going on. That it was, the stroke was right there, and I couldn't, I couldn't get the word out. So, oh, there's a couple of things over here about uh, difficulty uh, with language, uh, and these are pretty obvious. Terms to know: apraxia is um, the loss of task, task performance without the loss of movement. Like, button your shirt. You can't do that. Um, do this. Well, I, I can move my arm, but I can't coordinate the movement to do that. Agnosia is a loss of sensation, and it can be of anything. Uh, stereoagnosis, you recall, is um, what you put in the hand there. You know, identify an object. Not being able to do that, it, a stereoagnosis. Visual agnosia is not recognizing your grandmother. Auditory agnosia, and, and so on. Okay? Receptive aphasia versus apha uh, expressive aphasia. Make sure you have these differences uh, burned into your brain. This is kind of, read that paragraph.
That's kind of cool. I mean, nothing about that makes sense. Yeah, you can sit there and read it perfectly well. All you got to have is the first and the last letter in the right order, and you're good to go. Another little trick is whether you're right eye dominant or left eye dominant. Right? Have you ever done that before? Take your hand, do like that. So you got just a little peephole. Focus it, um, focus it right there. Put your arms out, focus right there. Keep both eyes open. Now bring that to you. Most of you are going to go to your right eye. Yeah. Who went to the left eye? One, two, y'all are freaks. <laughs> so most people are right eye dominant. You can't, you cannot fool yourself. You cannot make it go to the other side. You cannot do that. If you have both eyes open looking through that hole, it's going to go to that eye every time. Except the case. That really went to the middle of the head. I mean, Lindsay. Right? So, see, you, you interrupted. There, there's an associational fiber between these two. Every day they look more and more like each other. Memory, uh, interesting, memory, uh, or just widely throughout the cortex. The thing about memories is um, this structure here, the hippocampus. The hippocampus is what uh, enables you to store uh, short-term memories into processing into long-term memories. Without a hippocampus, you can't process or you can't store new memories. One thing that's kind of funny is that uh, this last bullet point right here, uh, you get memories that are moving back and forth between short and long-term memory here. Eventually they settle in long-term memory if it's something. But as they, as they move back and forth, some people attach other things to those memories that are just fantasy. I mean, and so you wind up down here as you rewrite memories, you start putting things with them that actually didn't happen. I got a friend of mine, he's a physician. He'll start, he'll tell a story about uh, we were hunting or something, we were driving to Canada, and he'll start be tell, he'll tell the story to somebody else. He'll go into all this stuff that, that we did from this trip. I'm looking at him, we didn't do any of that. I don't know where you got that information, but we didn't do any of that. That's what he's doing here as he's rewriting memories. He's attaching other things to it that really didn't happen. It's the craziest thing. You know people like that? I mean, they'll start telling you a story. It's like, wait a minute. I had my clothes on. <laughs> anyway, there are different types of memories here. Um, get a little close to home there with Halo. <laughs> Different types of memories here. There are declarative memories and non-declarative memories. You need to get uh, straight which ones are which. Declarative memories are just, I think I've mentioned before in a previous slide, just facts. Um, things that you know, you've learned, facts. Uh, declarative memories, uh, non-declarative memories come in a couple of different forms. One of them is uh, riding a bike, playing an instrument, walking, language, those types of things. Things that you do without having to think about them. These over here, you're thinking about them. Here, you don't have to think about them. And then you get into classic, classical conditioning type thing. And this is supposed to be Pavlov's dog here. There is a state associated with the bell. When you ring the bell, he salivates. So that's, it took me forever to figure out what I know. And then, of course, the example of the snake that we talked about and how you uh, how you react to it was is uh, part of amygdala, but in the limbic system. But your memories associated with that have to do with uh, non-declarative memory. All right. Limbic lobe. Uh, back in a long time ago, they recognized that the limbic lobe is different because it's a three-layered cortex. All of this stuff is three-layered cortex. This is old, old stuff. The 
four F of limbic function are here, uh, fighting, flight, seeking, fooling around. Um, this is one of the old experiments where they they've, uh, attached, uh, put deep electrodes into the brain of a cat. And if you uh, turn it on or turn it off, here's a poor little mouse here. Uh, here the cat is scared of it, and here he attacks it. So depending on how the limbic system uh, views things or is stimulated depending depends on the response you get. And we talked about that. Okay? This continuum. Right? Okay. Attaches emotion to the environment. The components of the limbic system are here. Uh, olfaction. If you look at the amount of uh, cerebral cortex to, dedicated to olfaction between us and a rat, it's completely opposite of higher cortical function. Olfactory bulbs, olfactory tracts, we know about those. The olfactory uh, nerves themselves are in the respiratory mucosa, send their axons to the cribriform plate, synapse on mitral cells in the bulb, they project to the brain. When they go to the brain, they, they divide into three different uh, little stria. And those stria distribute to different parts of the cortex. The point I want to make here is that the olfactory nerve projects to the cortex, and it's to the cortex related to the limbic system, the entorhinal cortex, the perihippocampal gyrus, that sort of area. The medial temporal lobe is what I'm talking about. I told you 9,000 times that olfaction is the only sensation that reaches the cortex without first going through the what structure? Thalamus. Right. Okay. Oh, it's in there, right there. Again. If you look at where this uh, medial temporal lobe is, it's right here. Remember the uncus, the perihippocampal gyrus from the previous slide? Okay. If we take a section through here and look at it, so we're going to look at this gyrus right here. It's kind of cool. Here's the gyrus right here. We've got this gray matter that comes up and around. That's called the hippocampus. That one right there, the yellowish one, is called the dyslexic gyrus. This is all gray matter tract that we get input into this area here. That's part of Papez circuit. Papez circuit is illustrated here. And I mentioned this uh, Tuesday. We perceive the environment from the neocortex. That information makes it into the cingulate gyrus. The cingulate gyrus projects into the perihippocampal gyrus. The hippocampus is right there in that gyrus. The hippocampus starts formulating memories. The information goes up through the fornix to the mammillary bodies where the memories and your environment now are in the hypothalamus. Do I need to... Um, so if you've attached an emotion to it, do I need to have a visceral response to it? I'm in the hypothalamus, I can do it. So um, as I do an emotional response to something, that information goes up through the anterior nucleus of the thalamus and back to the cingulate ducts. It's a circuit. And you're always feeding the environmental information into that circuit. As I said, every second of every minute of every day, you're constantly interpreting your environment and your body's reacting to it. That's how. The area, the, the problem with the hippocampus, though, uh, is that it's, it's so metabolically active, it doesn't take much of a, uh, an ischemic event to, to destroy it. It doesn't take much of a disease like Alzheimer's 
to, to disrupt it. So that's where you have here memory, one of the first things to go. Where did I put my car keys? Right. This is an illustration of PayPass circuit. Um, you know, it used to be thought that PayPass circuit was uh, involved in um, emotion, attaching emotion to it, and that's true to a certain, you know, to a large extent. But also, though, it's it's important in transferring memories from short to long term memory. The hippocampus plays a very vital role in that. The hippocampus plays a very vital role in transferring short-term memory. Short-term memories is an hour. Beyond that, you're in long-term memories. So the, the thing is, is, once something is in long-term memory, in order to get it out of long-term memory, you have to recall it. To keep it from going into long-term memory, you have to actively not put it there. In order to get something out of long-term memory, you have to have used it in the past. You have stored in your brain every long-term memory you've ever had. Even when you were two years old. It's there. You just don't retrieve it. That's the thing I was telling you about the first day. You can remember who your first grade teacher was. but not your seventh grade algebra teacher or whatever. Limbic lesions and syndrome, uh, syndromes. We talked about Kluver-Busey syndrome with the tips of the uh, temporal lobes, the uh, bilateral destruction of the amygdala. Alzheimer's disease with dementia and memory. And then Korsakoff syndrome is, um, I'll save that for just a second. Kluver Busey, here's the detail of that. We've already described that. Um, let me get to this. Korsakoff syndrome here, uh, and Dr. Um, Morgan, I think, mentioned it several times yesterday, um, versus Wernicke's uh, encephalopathy. These are destructions of the, uh, essentially the PAPES or the limbic system, uh, usually due to alcohol related. This is the thiamine, thiamine thing you're trying to prevent when you give the glucose. Um, the Korsakoff syndrome is, I mentioned it, the amnesic, uh, the confabulatory syndrome. And he uh, gave me an example of it yesterday where people, they come up with these amazing stories of their accomplishments, and none of them are true. So. Fanciful realities. Um, the limbic lesions. Uh, temporal lobe epilepsy. Um, the one that we want to focus on here is because the medial temporal lobes are the most sensitive to ischemia. I've already talked about that. Uh, and what goes to that what goes to that area? Olfaction. So most people with uh, temporal lobe uh, seizures have an aura of a foul odor. And he mentioned yesterday that it was of what? Burning rubber? Burning rubber? Yeah. Or it's some putrid smell, something it's never a pleasant smell. It's always a bad smell. And this occurs uh, a few minutes before the seizure activity starts. An uncle seizure is what they're called. Temporal lobe epilepsy, it's the same thing. He did mention yesterday that some of these people have deja vu. Why do you have deja vu? Because of the memories of the hippocampus. Why do you have an autonomic response? because of the fornix projecting to the mammillary bodies as a direct input to the hypothalamus. Dementia, we talked about dementia 500 times. Um, and here we go. Anterior grade memory versus retrograde memory. 
people with uh, dementia, um, boy, they can, oh, Don, he could, he could tell you exactly, I mean, he could tell you what he had for breakfast in 1943. Couldn't tell you what he had for breakfast this morning. Declarative versus uh, non-declarative memories. Uh, dementia usually doesn't mess with uh, a lot of the non-declarative memories. I mean, he still could do whatever he wanted to do. He still ride a bike. He still had perfect language. It's just that um, he got quite confused about how to use it. Here's a little clinical tip. Hallucination. I love hallucination. Um, visual hallucinations are most of the time due to drugs. Uh, you've been on the meth binge for five days, you haven't slept, it's drugs. Auditory hallucinations, uh, most of the time schizophrenia. Olfactory hallucinations, temporal lobe epilepsy. Uh, I had a patient one time that she said, she, she was a schizophrenic. Sometimes they can have visual hallucinations. She was saying that at night, the, uh, she would lie in bed and she would see the spiders crawling up a wall. And one, that was her chief complaint. Her chief concern was, what do I do about the spiders? Chief co complaint wasn't, oh my gosh, I have schizophrenia. The chief concern was, I don't want the spiders to get me. How do I, how would you treat that? Get bug spray. <laughs> That's all you gotta do is get bug spray and you take care of the spiders. That's all the problem. Okay, I'm not kidding with you. I told her to get bug spray, and it solved the problem. She came in happy as could be. She probably had bug spray all over her. <laughs> she was uh, happy as could be. Uh, any questions? Uh, about anything? Thank you, everybody, for watching.